I'm Chris Wallace. President Trump puts a second justice on the Supreme Court as the Senate votes to confirm Brett Kavanaugh. The eyes are 50. The nays are 48. A few hours ago, the U.S. Senate confirmed Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court. We'll discuss what Kavanaugh's confirmation means for the court, Congress, and the country with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. And we'll talk about the bitter politics behind the vote. Truly, Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation is a low moment for the Senate, for the court, for the country. With two top senators, Republican Lindsey Graham and Democrat Ben Cardin. Then, with just 30 days till the midterm elections, will the GOP victory in the court fight work against them in November? Shame! 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 You don't hand matches to an arsonist, and you don't give power to an angry left-wing mob. We'll ask RNC Chair McDaniel. It's a Fox News Sunday exclusive. Plus our Sunday panel on whether the Kavanaugh battle is finally President Trump and the Republican Party. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. After weeks of shocking accusations, loud <clears throat> protests, and hardball politics, Judge Brett Kavanaugh is now Justice Kavanaugh. The Senate confirmed him by a 50 to 48 almost straight party line vote. Kavanaugh is expected to take his place on the Supreme Court Tuesday, cementing a solid 5-4 to four conservative majority. Kavanaugh's confirmation is expected to shift the balance of power on the court for a generation. It is certain to influence midterm elections that are now just 30 days away. In a moment, we'll speak with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. But first, let's bring in Fox News correspondent Kevin Cork with the latest. The nomination of Brett M. Kavanaugh of Maryland to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States is confirmed. With the rap of the gavel, history. But Justice Brett Kavanaugh's road to the Supreme Court was more than the culmination of years of hard work and months of political machinations. It spawned resistance movements on both ends of the political spectrum. Resist Trump and resist mob rule. Shame! From the halls of Congress to the steps of the Capitol, in the shadow of the High Court itself, protests reverberated across Washington. In the end, it was success for the man who will replace his mentor on the court, and for a president, sweet victory after a long, bitter battle. And I want to thank our incredible Republican senators for refusing to back down in the face of the Democrats' shameless campaign of political and personal destruction. Amid the finality, bruising contrast of victory and defeat, a divided America, and the promise of more battles to come. So to Americans, the so many millions who are outraged by what happened here, there's one answer, vote. Chris, Monday at 7 p.m. here at the White House, the President will welcome Justice Kavanaugh for wearing an event. Then Tuesday morning, it is off to work. His first day as an Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Chris. Kevin Cork reporting from the White House. Kevin, thanks for that. Joining me now from Louisville, Kentucky, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Senator, you have called putting conservative justices on the court, conservative judges on all levels of the court, the most consequential action that you can take in your role. I want to put up what the record is. Under President Trump, with you as Majority Leader, two Supreme Court justices have been confirmed, and 26 judges have been put on circuit courts. That's the fastest pace in history. Question, sir, is this your proudest moment as a senator? I think so. I think the most uh, important thing the Senate is involved in is the personnel business. The House is not in the personnel business. Uh, and of the various 1,200 appointments that come to us for confirmation, obviously the most important are the lifetime appointments to the court. But we've prioritized uh, handling President Trump's outstanding nominees for the Supreme Court, as well as 
uh, the circuit courts, and we've done 26 so far, as you indicated, a record, and there'll be more before the end of the year. Some hard-right conservatives have criticized you over the year as too establishment, but now they are lining up to praise you for ramming through the Kavanaugh nomination, and even the likes of Steve Bannon has praised your, what he called, strong leadership. Are you happy to have his approval, sir? It's almost an out-of-body experience, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you take this criticism that, it, it, you know, that the Tea Party, the far right of the, of the Republican Party, has had of you over the years as you've been trying to do your business up on Capitol Hill? Well, it's hard to be the majority leader of the Senate without getting some criticism. I'd rather be judged by my record, and I think this has been an extraordinarily accomplished Congress. Uh, in fact, the, the most productive two-year period right of center the time I've been in the Senate, whether it's taxes, uh, regulations, uh, we've gotten the economy uh, booming, and we're making long-term uh, systemic changes in the courts that will serve uh, future generations of Americans in a very good way. I know that there have been some bipartisan accomplishments as well. You voted on an FAA bill in this last week. You also did a big bill uh, to fight the opioid crisis. But there, there's no question that this Kavanaugh confirmation battle has come at a cost that just the relations between Republican senators and Democratic senators seem to have, have taken a down Here's Democratic Senator, Sen uh, Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer uh, on the floor this week talking uh, about and criticizing you for delaying them after what he said was your 10-month delay uh, and blocking the nomination of Merrick Garland from President Obama. Here's Schumer. No American should accept his admonishments about delay. He's the master of delay compared to 10 months. Leaving the Scalia seat open? Who are we kidding? Senator, how broken is the Senate? The Senate's not broken, and we didn't attack Merrick Garland's uh, background and try to destroy him. We didn't go on a search and destroy mission. We simply followed the tradition in America, which is that if you have a party of the different, uh, a different uh, Senate of a different party than the president, you don't fill a vacancy created in a presidential year. That went all the way back to 1888. But himself said 18 months before the end of the Bush t tenure that if a vacancy occurred, they would fill it. So what we did was follow tradition. But we didn't attack the nominee. We didn't go on a search and destroy mission. I agree that with uh, Chuck Schumer, this has been a low point in the Senate. I have a different view about who caused the low point. Uh, Senate Judiciary Democrats uh, leaking uh, Dr. Ford's name uh, against apparently her hires trying to lower the standard and, and say that the presumption of innocence no longer applies uh, in the United States of America. And then the mob uh, descended on uh, Capitol Hill and tried to intimidate our members into opposing this good man's uh, nomination. Uh, we stood up to the mob. We established that the, the presumption of innocence is still important. I'm proud of my colleagues. This is an important day for the United States Senate. I, I have to pick up on something that you said, because it, it, maybe I have this wrong, but when you block Merrick Garland's nomination from President Obama, you basically said that we don't do this in a presidential election year and that we wait until the election and then whoever the people choose, they get to pick the Supreme Court nominee. But, but what you just said now was it's a question of whether or not it's the, the, uh, the, the party in control of the Senate is different than the president. I, the question I guess I, I'm getting to here is, if Donald Trump were to name somebody in the final year of his first term in 2020, are you saying that you would go ahead with that nomination? Well, I understand your question, and what I told you was what the, what the history of the Senate has been. You have to go back to 1880 to find the last time a vacancy created in a presidential election year on the Supreme Court was confirmed by a Senate of a different party than the president. So, That's the history. So an, if you can't if answer my direct a, if question, if we, if, are you saying that if well, Donald the, Trump... The, the, the answer to your question is we'll see whether there's a vacancy in 2020. But you're not ruling out the possibility, since you're the Republican majority leader and there's a Republican president, that you would go for and, and, and uh, push the nomination of a Trump nominee in the election year. 
What I'm telling you is, the history is, you have to go back to 1880 to find the last time a Senate controlled by a party different from the president filled a vacancy on the Supreme Court that was created in the middle of a presidential election year. That's been the history. Final question, sir. In the Alabama Senate race last year, you very quickly said, after Judge Roy Moore was accused of inappropriate conduct towards teenagers uh, many years ago, you immediately said that you believed the women. Why didn't you believe Christine Blasey Ford? I can't imagine comparing Brett Kavanaugh to Roy Moore. Well, uh, but there, the comparison. I'm not. I'm not comparing them. Them. I'm comparing the fact well, that multi multiple witnesses over and over and over kept popping up. Here we had an FBI investigation, and three members of our conference who were undecided took a look at the uh, FBI investigation, and two of the three decided to confirm Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, the only point I'd make, or uh, not trying to get an intimate with you, is you opposed the FBI investigation. No, I didn't. I, it was negotiated in my office. Uh, we, we agreed on the parameters of the FBI investigation in a meeting in my office Friday a week ago. Senator Mikowski, Senator Collins, Senator Flake. That was the scope of the FBI investigation. We agreed it would go on for a week, and we agreed we would talk to the people that Dr. Ford had mentioned and the people that... Uh, Ramirez had mentioned, and that's the investigation that was done. And our members who were undecided took a look at the uh, report, and two out of three of them decided to support the nominee. Senator McConnell, thank but you. It, uh, but, but Chris, I think it's outrageous to compare Brett Kavanaugh to Roy Moore. I, I didn't do so. I was simply comparing the fact that in one case you believe the accusers, and in another case you didn't. I'm not comparing Judge Roy Moore and Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, good, because there is no comparison. <laughs> okay, on that we're agreed. Thank you for your time today, sir. And congratulations. Now joining us here in Washington, a key Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Lindsey Graham. Uh, Senator, and I, I, hes I hes hesitate to get into this after my conversation with Mitch McConnell, I think of you generally as a happy political warrior. But i got to say, over the last couple of weeks, yeah. you have seemed angry. And I guess I'm, I'm questioning... What has gotten so much under your skin? I want to take a look at, at Lindsey Graham over the last couple of weeks. Here you are. This is the most unethical sham since I've been in politics. I thought she was handled respectfully. I thought Kavanaugh was treated like crap. Yeah, well, boo yourself. <laughs> so why are you? Well, now you're look, you seem happy, but why are you, how have you been an unhappy warrior these couple of weeks? I'm happy because the effort to humiliate and railroad a man I've known for 20 years who's never been banned from a mall, unlike Roy Moore, failed. I'm happy that those who tried to destroy his life fell short. I'm glad that those who tried to overturn the rule of law and replace it with mob rule lost. I've never been more pissed in my life. I voted for Sotomayor and Kagan. I would have never done this to them. This was character assassination. This was warning power too much. And to the extent that I came to the aid of this good man and helped defeat this debacle, I am happy as a clam. All right. Well, let me add, tell you something that may not make you happy or bring it up, because it appears the Kavanaugh confirmation is not going to end this fight. Uh, Democratic right. Congressman Jerry Nadler yeah. uh, of New York, who would, if the Democrats take the House, become the House Judiciary Chairman, has already talked about launching an investigation into alleged misconduct by Kavanaugh. Nancy Pelosi says she wants to see the FBI interviews in the second background check. It, it doesn't sound like this is going to end. Well, it's, uh, we'll know in November if that makes sense. I hope everybody running for the House in these purple districts will, ask, will be asked the question, do you support impeaching Judge Kavanaugh based on five allegations, none of which could be corroborated? Do you want an outcome so badly that you would uh, basically turn the law upside down? Uh, all I can say is that this is going to the streets at the ballot box. Uh, I'm gonna, I've never campaigned against a colleague in my life. That's about to change. I'm going to go throughout this country and let people in these, at, you know, purple states, uh, states where Trump won, know what I thought, know what I think about this process. Now, we were talking before we came on the air, and I see that you have a list 
of mm -hmm. the, all the people that the president has said are on the list for potential nominees. What's your point? Well, here's my point. This is a list that was compiled in November, but he actually put it out uh, during the campaign. There are 20 something people on this list. I'm asking Chuck Schumer, name five, name three, name one that would be okay with you. Brett Kavanaugh was a mainstream judge. I would have chosen him if I'd been president. Uh, Bush supported him. Everybody running for president on our side believed that Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch were outstanding conservative jurists. The other side wants to cancel the election. So, Chuck, you want somebody new. Look at this list and see if there's anybody you agree to. But what we want to do, Senator Schumer, is to overturn the election. And you pick the judges. We're not going to let you pick the judges. If you want to pick judges, then you need to win the White House. When uh, Obama won, I voted for two judges that he picked. So Chuck Schumer, name one person on this list you think is acceptable. There is a tough column in the New York Times today that, that attacks you. I want to put some of it up. Frank Bruni writes, I can't think of another Republican whose journey from anti-Trump outrage to pro-Trump obsequiousness quite so illogical or half as sad and he suggests that you are auditioning to replace jeff Sessions as attorney general your response sir uh frank you don't know what you're talking about in your world frank it's a noble cause to destroy a judicial candidate who's conservative whether it be thomas alito bork now kavanaugh i'm bipartisan when it makes sense uh, I try to have a good disposition because I like my job, but don't mistake that I don't care about the conservative cause. So if I made you upset because I would not legitimize McCarthyism, then good. And I think I can survive in South Carolina. Senator Graham, thank you. Always good to talk with you, sir. You. And I'm glad to see you're back in a good mood. I'm a good mood, and I like Ben Carton. There you go. Now, is it true you're going <laughs> for all this talk about you and obsequiousness? Are you going to go play golf with the president today? Yeah, and I'm not going to give him any strokes. You know, this third term thing is looking better. Uh, ben, I <laughs> uh, hope you win. You're a good man. <laughs> I I, that I may survive. be the kiss of death. That, 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 that may be the end of Ben. All right. And now we want to hear from the other side. Democratic <laughs> Senator Ben Carter joins us. Like all but one of his Democratic colleagues, he voted against Kavanaugh's confirmation. Senator Cardin, welcome back to Fox News Sunday, and I apologize for him praising you. No, that's well, Chris, not so. It's good to be with you, and Lynn and I work on many issues together. Uh, we certainly disagree on, on this one. Okay, let's start with the bottom line. What impact do you think Justice Kavanaugh will have on the Supreme Court? How dramatically, drastically do you think he will move it to the well, this is Justice Kennedy's seat, and Justice Kennedy was a balancing uh, factor on the Supreme Court. We are very concerned about protecting the progress we've made on, on health care issues, on women's constitutional rights, on protecting the Mueller investigation. So all those issues we think are at risk, and it's going to put, I think, more interest in the Congress in the United States to protect health care, to protect women's rights, and protect that no one's above the law. But doesn't a president, getting back to Kavanaugh, doesn't a president deserve broad deference when he chooses a business for the Supreme Court as long as that person is in the judicial mainstream? And I think we all agree that he's certainly to the right side, but he's in the judicial mainstream. I mean, the fact is, Democratic presidents are going to appoint liberals and Republican presidents are going to appoint conservatives. Don't, don't as, as Senator Graham said, uh, President Trump won. This was an issue in the campaign. Doesn't he deserve deference when he picks a conservative justice? I don't believe that Justice Kavanaugh is in the mainstream of judicial thought. Take a look at his decisions. There's a trend. Every one of those decisions where he was in the minority or he was deciding to vote, it was on behalf of special interests, on behalf of the powerful against the individual. Consumer cases, environmental cases, labor cases, one after another. And then his response to Dr. Ford where he showed that, that he was not, uh, didn't have the judicial temperament, and he wasn't impartial, he was partisan. I think those issues really came out during this process. And it does concern us as to whether he'll be an independent voice on the Supreme Court and the check and balance in our system. Uh, Senator Graham pointed out he had the list, I think it's 25, 26 uh, judges that, you know, are all members of the courts of appeal, or state Supreme Courts. Now, I, I'm not asking you, but I mean, my guess is that you and Chuck Schumer and a lot of Democrats would say not a single person 
on that list is a member of the judicial mainstream. So, Chris, the way it should go, the way that former presidents have done, they developed the list, not an outside group. They're the ones who developed the list. And yes, they do talk to the members of the Senate before they make the nomination and try to, to narrow the list to one that will be more acceptable uh, among the United States senators. That, that's how the process, the, when, when Barack Obama was president, he took both Democrats and Republicans on the Judiciary Committee before he made his, his announcements. That's the way the process, you don't take an outside list by an outside group. But haven't Republicans been less political about Supreme Court confirmations than Democrats. I want to put some statistics up on the screen. Take a look at how many yes votes Democratic nominees have gotten since Bill Clinton. These are the Democrats appointed by Clinton and Obama, from Ginsburg with 96 votes to Kagan with 63. Now take a look at the Republican nominees by Bush 43 and now President Trump, from Roberts with 78 to Kavanaugh with 50. Senate Democrats have been much less likely to cross the aisle and vote for a Republican nominee than Republicans have been to vote for a Democratic nominee. Well, let me also point out that even though some of those were below 60, the, the, the filibuster was not used until Judge Gorsuch to change the number from 60 to 50. That put us in different quarters. So the change that Senator McConnell made to the rules on the Supreme Court really caused us to be much more partisan in this. But, since but, we didn't but in fairness, point. you guys first in 2013, not for the Supreme Court, but for lower court judges. And we so, I mean, back, there are no hands no, that are clean no, I agree. We go back and forth. Of course, you, uh, the Republicans block President Obama for putting anyone on the Court of Appeals of the district. Right. So uh, we go back and forth here. My point is this. We need to have a president who will consult with Congress, the United States Senate, before he makes those nominations, have an open process for entering nominees, not restrict himself to the federal society. Final America. question. How big an issue do you think this will be in the midterms if Democrats have already been mobilized, Republicans are saying you gave them a political gift by your opposition and that this is going to energize Republicans? I think it's going to uh, boil down to our concerns about whether we're going to protect the gains we've made in health care on pre-existing conditions, where we're concerned about the Mueller investigation being interfered with. I think, yes, a constitutional right to women, uh, those issues are going to be on the ballot in the midterm, and, and Judge Kavanaugh underscores those issues. Senator Cardin, thank you. Thanks for coming. And always a pleasure to talk with you. Here. Up next, Kavanaugh's confirmation is a big victory for conservatives, but will there be a lasting cost to Congress and the court? We'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss the fallout next. I stand before you today on the heels of a tremendous victory for our nation, our people, and our beloved Constitution. President Trump a rally last night in Kansas reacting to the hard-fought confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. And it's time now for our Sunday group, Josh Holmes, Senator Mitch McConnell's former chief of staff and now a GOP strategist, columnist for The Hill, Juan Williams, the co-host of Benson and Harf on Fox News Radio, Marie Harf, Fox News Politics Editor Chris Meyerwald, author of the new book, Every Man a King. So, Josh, as a former chief of staff for Mitch McConnell, how determined was he to get this nomination through? How disturbed was he by the ugly turn it took in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, I mean, look, I think we've learned for the 10,000th time in the last 10 years that you better pack a lunch and buckle your chin strap if you're going to come at Mitch McConnell when it comes to a Senate battle. And I think this, once again, demonstrated his resolve in get, uniting his conference and making sure that they got to the end of it. what was an incredibly ugly process. And, and how the accusations by women, to what degree do you think? Because it, it seemed to be a, a, a fairly routine, tough, but fairly routine confirmation until that point. And, and that must have been tough for everybody on both sides. Well, it's it, unprecedented in a lot of ways, right? It, I think the, the thing that was most disturbing to Republican senators is the wide presumption of innocence completely evaporate before our eyes in the context of a Senate Judiciary Committee, that all of a sudden allegations, however serious they might be, without any kind of corroboration, were begin, beginning to carry the day. And I think from McConnell's point of view and from Lindsey Graham, your previous, what, what they tried to do was get to the information, provide the information, make sure that every senator had an opportunity to not only review the FBI report, but all of the testimony and letters that came in, and eventually they would come to the conclusion that Judge Kavanaugh should be Justice Kavanaugh. 
Marie, I know that Democrats are going to do their best to link the events of this week and the last few weeks to the Me Too movement and to say it's another demonstration of Republicans' hostility towards women. Uh, I want to play, though, a clip from the deciding vote on this issue, and that was a woman, uh, Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine. Here she is. The allegations failed to meet the more likely than not standard. Therefore, I do not believe that these charges can fairly prevent Judge Kavanaugh from serving on the court. Marie, what are Republicans supposed to do when the FBI does this background check and fails to come up with a single piece of evidence to corroborate Dr. Ford's story? What are they supposed to do? Well, I think what you'll hear from Democrats, Chris, is that it became clear over the past week, particularly since the hearing, right, that everything since that hearing, the FBI investigation, who they were allowed to actually speak to, the fact that they didn't re-interview Brett Kavanaugh or Christine Ford, it became clear to many people that this appeared to be a box-checking exercise, that it was a fig leaf designed, they, wait, wait, wait. designed they, to provide legitimacy they had talked to, for predetermined They talked outcomes. to everybody that Christine Blasey Ford had put near that house that night and other people who weren't at the house that night but might have be able to cast light what i mean yes they say well she didn't talk to people she had talked to in the in, on the beach 20 years later but in terms of anybody who had a contemporaneous account they talked to everybody they didn't get her therapist notes from years but ago 20 years later about, that's fine chris but that's for the therapist but, yes, but i will say look but everything provided. you and i are about right now they didn't do right so to many people who already believe the republic has a problem with women this exercise this week-long investigation to them will look like it was just designed to give legitimacy to a preordained outcome and it's, it's what's been said since then it's donald trump making fun of christine ford it's orrin hatch telling survivors of sexual assault he will listen to them when they grow up this is a pattern. This anger has been building for two years since Donald Trump was elected. Me Too started a year ago on Friday. This is not just about the Supreme Court. This is about the broader cultural moment we are living in and a lot of people feeling like the Republican Party, quite frankly, doesn't care about women. Uh, well, That's the argument Democrats are going to make, I think. I think this was brutish politics. I agree with Marie. I think the FBI probe was a sham. It was a whitewash. And I think most people understand that the constraints were put in place by the White House. This was a thoroughly political process. Well, I think, let me finish, true. Josh. I think the damage here is to so many American institutions. We're past the point. Obviously, he is confirmed. They did this in a rush yesterday as if there's more to come and they want to make sure that he's already in place. But the key here is damage. We've seen damage to our intelligence institutions under this president, to the FBI okay. right. directly. We're not going to have a... Hang we're, on. We're talking I'm about telling this, you the Supreme this Court, The Supreme Court now is damaged, Chris, in a lasting way. All right. Let me... And, let me, let me and, no, and, but, oh, go ahead. Well, I, well, I was we do have... I was going to yeah, finish We, we want to play well with, uh, with no, others no, I'm here. I'm playing well. All I right. Finish uh, my Chris, point. go ahead. Look, uh, this is going to intensify voters on both ends of the spectrum. This has turned up the volume. I was already a very intense, very embittered midterm. Wait, uh, we're going to get to politics in the next segment. What do you think of the argument that this was a sham, the FBI investigation, that it wasn't a serious investigation? Well, you know you're in Washington when uh, one week the Republicans tell you that the FBI is a rotten, corrupt institution that should not be listened to, and the Democrats say that they are the saviors of our republic, and then you wait a week and they just switch lanes. The White House has turned around and loves the FBI, and Democrats say they stink. So I don't put, I don't put too much... I don't put too much stick in that because those are situational opinions and attitudes that are going to shift with the next controversy. I think, I think there's one thing that we need to clear up here because I, I, Democrats have just sort of reappropriated facts on how this FBI investigation came to be. And what happened was Senator Flake decided, uh, along with Senator Coons, that they needed interviews that weren't before the Senate Judiciary Committee in order to have a more full, fulsome decision. So that when they went to Leader McConnell and sat down and talked about what that FBI investigation might look like, it wasn't Donald Trump who was dictating the terms of the FBI investigation. In fact, it were the senators who still had an open mind about the nomination itself. They are the ones that dictate right, the terms of the let Marie. But Josh, I would say, can you admit that the fact that the two key people weren't re-interviewed 
that there were no. numerous people who gave information and, and were never contacted by the FBI. That left lingering questions, and, and it, it... It's a talking it, point, right? It's it, not... It, it, you know no. what, though? As someone who tried to look at this fairly, I don't think it's a talking point. I heard from Republicans over the last three years, why was Hillary Clinton interviewed so late in the FBI? Why wasn't she under oath? They didn't even interview Judge Kelly. All right, let's What so, about ism if you want? But the, the simple matter is, the way this works under penalty minds. of perjury, whether it's with the Senate Judiciary Committee, or whether it's the FBI, and interview is an interview is an interview. And we had three plus hours of Judge Kavanaugh, three plus hours not of Dr. Ford. Not by investigators, by senators, not by FBI it trained investigators. It is a matter of public record, and that is the same thing that you get in an FBI investigation. And so this is it's absolutely <laughs> a talking point. The idea that we don't know what each each person's take was on the situation it's after all this point. only, only all right. Uh, underscores that I'm glad we have settled this, this and that but, now but, with the confirmation the all this is we're having is the debate happening out there right now well we're right? going to talk about the politics <laughs> we're going to bring you back a little bit later to talk about this up next we'll discuss the political fallout from the Kavanaugh confirmation and how it will shape the vote in the November midterms now just 30 days away Republican Party chair Ronna McDaniel joins us next Over the past few weeks, every American has now seen the profound stakes in the upcoming election. You now see it. We have been energized. If Democrats are willing to cause such destruction in the pursuit of power, just imagine the devastation they would cause. The only reason to vote Democrat is if you're tired of winning, right? <laughs> tired of winning. We want to win, win, win. We want to win, win, win. So we're going to bring in Dan Bongino, former NYPD officer. <laughs> He's a winner. Secret Service agent, host of the Dan Bongino Show, never tired, author of the blockbuster book Spygate, the attempt to sabotage Donald J. Trump, hitting shelves this Tuesday. Spygate, coming out this Tuesday. Get it. If you love his podcast or you love him on the show, you're going to love the book. Dan, sometimes we don't step back enough in these moments and, and, and take, take stock of what's been accomplished. Talk to us about the gravity of, of this confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah, you know, Pete, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was on Twitter all day. You know, Saturday is usually my day off, and I was working all day. Uh, is I'm Twitter in your work, like you Is Twitter your work? Yeah, I, I, I'm a, it is. It is. I'm, like, I married it. to it. I, I can't get up. And I, I thought about this yesterday. You know, uh, we've heard from the swamp and the media and the editorial columns of the Washington Post and the New York Times forever, Pete, how inept and incompetent Donald Trump is, right? I mean, we, the, the media just assumes it to be true. Yet don't you find it odd how he just keeps routinely kicking their butts at every, politically speaking, of course, I'll leave the violent stuff for the left, at every single opportunity, we've now seen tax cuts, a, a, a boom in the economy, two Supreme Court justices, we're only two years in. This guy is a builder. Everybody needs to remember this. I grew up in Queens. I know New York well. He builds stuff. The result to him was an actual building you could touch, look at, and feel. He's not a politician where everything exists in yeah. the political uh, ether. He builds stuff, and he's building a legacy now. And I'll tell you, he put a big stamp on it yesterday. Well, Dan, we're going to put up on the wall here so you can see the list of accomplishments of President Trump. You can see it coming up there, although I can't read all that. Let me just ask you this, though. Uh, when you look at the conservative court, you look at the massive tax cut, you look at the strengthening of the military, the booming economy, the lower, uh, uh, lowest unemployment in nearly 50 years. I was telling Pete and Rachel earlier, I feel like Trump is... King Arthur that's pulled Excalibur out of the rot for conservatives. I mean, we've had so many Republicans from George Bush to John McCain to Mitt Romney that tried and couldn't deliver it. Now he's delivered it. Will not only the media is never going to give him the credit for it, but will the people that were never Trumpers finally say he's delivered the conservative promises we've wanted for the last half century? You know, I'm glad you asked that question the way you did, Griff, because that's been the, the big question. We're never going to get the liberal media. Forget that. They just they, they personally, viscerally dislike Donald Trump and keep humiliating themselves. But what the big question is the never Trumpers, like you said, and the establishmentarians, are they ever going to accept the fact that, all right, you may have some stylistic differences with the president. I personally like his style. But are you ever going to accept the fact that he's actually accomplished stuff? And I think the Kavanaugh selection and the strategic genius of it was a big step to I mean, think about this, Griff. Who was the one guy, the one guy who could unite the factions knowing the Democrats were going to come full bore at him if nominated for the Supreme Court? 
a Bush guy, Brett Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. yeah. an unquestionable conservative, mm -hmm. but a Bush appointee. I mean, it was a genius pick, and yet everybody makes it out like Donald Trump just casually walked into it, and this was some kind of, just, oh, he just did it by mistake. It was a strategically genius pick. He united the factions. Great job again. Yeah, they always underestimate him. It's very interesting. So now, always. And, and this, I want to bring up a topic that's actually very personal to me. You know, my husband's a member of Congress. Um, there have now yeah. been death threats pouring into senators' personal cell phones um, at, since the Kavanaugh confirmation. And you can see from some of the statements coming out from Pelosi and others, and, and even this um, uh, from AG Eric Holder, that they are still ready to fight and mob, mob style. Like they are not putting down their swords, they're not learning their lessons. How long, how long will they keep going with this? Well, sadly, I don't think there is any stop to this. There is no finish line. But let me tell you why, Rachel. There's a reason for this, right? There's a difference between radical liberals and conservatives. I want to be clear. I'm not talking about heartland Democrat voters in America at all. I'm talking about the radical activist left. Here's the issue, right? We as conservatives believe in big R, God-given rights, right? And it puts an automatic emergency break in our behavior. We may dislike people ideologically, but that fact that we believe that God gave you rights and me rights, despite your beliefs, prevents us from obviously from attacking you, God forbid, or anything like that. The radical left has no emergency break. They're takers. They need to take your money, take your kids' education, your health care, and to do that, they need state power. Mm -hmm. And when they lose state power, and they lose the courts, and they lose the presidency, and they lose governorships, there's nowhere else to go, Rachel. There's no emergency oh, break. So, so they lash out. There's, there's one place for them to go, this. Dan. One place, and it's Iowa, because for so much of this this spectacle in the Senate, it was about 2020 for these ambitious senators, yeah. one of which Cory Spartacus Booker found himself in Iowa yesterday, uh, you know, playing off of this issue. This is what he said yesterday in Des Moines, Iowa. We're not defined by a president who mocks a hero in Dr. Blasey Ford. We're not defined. We're not defined by a president who does not believe women, we're going to be defined when this state not only says that we believe women, but we elect women. Just happened to be in Iowa. What do you think, Dan? Yeah. Well, he's embarrassed himself, uh, Sparky. He always reminds me of that Clueless movie with Alicia Silverstone where <laughs> she can't pronounce Sparty. She calls him Sporadicus. That's, that's Cory Booker. He's not Spartacus. He's Sporadicus. But what's really annoying about that is I refuse to accept that narrative. Listen, guys, uh, Dr. Ford was treated with respect and dignity. You may, not, you may not think her story as she told it was accurate. You might. I don't know where you stand. I'm just saying she was given the opportunity by the United States Senate, the Republican, and Donald Trump, by the way, who we had no problems with that. He actually incentivized them and said they should do it to go and tell her story in front of the United States Senate. So saying somehow Donald Trump doesn't believe women and he mocked uh, Dr. Ford there, he did not mock her. He transcribed, for, uh, it was a transcription of what she said. She couldn't remember details of the event. And I'm sorry, but Brett Kavanaugh was entitled to defend himself and Donald Trump was entitled to defend his nominee. Both right. sides were heard and one side mm -hmm. did not have the corroborating evidence. It's really that simple. That is absolutely right. Dan Bongino, thank you very much. As always, we appreciate having you. Thanks, Dan. You're in a better Thanks, mood guys. this week Thanks. than you were last week. Oh, because winning, I mean, winning <laughs> improves the mood. I was, I was very tired last week, but thanks, right. guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, All right. Dan. Thanks. All right, we're going to turn to some headlines. A vintage military plane is forced to make an emergency landing on a busy highway. The 1946 aircraft completely losing power in midair shortly after taking off in Mississippi. The pilot and everyone on the ground miraculously walking away without a scratch. The FAA is investigating. Millionaires are building luxury panic rooms inside their homes to hide from MS-13. They say several murders linked to the notorious gang has them on edge in the Hamptons. Their panic rooms aren't just comfortable, according to the New York Post. They are complete with fingerprint recognition and shatterproof glass. Panic room can cost up to $200,000. That's why Donald Trump was helping people who, you know, can't afford a panic room. Um, anonymous street artist Banksy now revealing that he's behind the self-destruction of his own painting moments after it sold for $1.4 million. Take a look. That's selling for $860.
Experts believe the shredded masterpiece increased at least 50% in value since it's part of art history. Banksy posting this on Instagram of a shredder being built in the frame. I didn't know about Banksy, but now we do. Think about the baller move that is, I'm going to auction off this painting, and then right when it's sold, I'm going to hit a button and it's going to shred, and now it's going to be worth twice as much? <laughs> I love it so that's my favorite story. The, the, of the things we call art. We nominated a Supreme Court nominee. Sorry. Anyway. All right. I'm being yelled at and told to go. Republican enthusiasm for President Trump and his accomplishments are in fever pitch. Our next guest explains why the president needs to stay in campaign mode. Plus, SNL goes all in against Republicans who supported Associate <laughs> Justice Kavanaugh. Their locker room celebration is ahead. <laughs> Mitch, how are you feeling? Uh, that was awesome. Woo! Welcome back. President Trump rallying a crowd of 10,000 just last night in Topeka and Republican voter enthusiasm on the rise, according to a new poll, Democrats advantage going from a 10 point lead to just two, a statistical tie here with more Republican strategist and pollster Chris Wilson. Hey, Chris, good morning. Good morning. What do you make of the waning Democratic enthusiasm gap? We're just a month away from the midterms. Well, you know, Griffin, in the poll you point out, you refer to as a national poll. Whenever I look at individual polling on states where I'm involved, right now I'm in Texas, where I look at the uh, enthusiasm for Senator Cruz and Governor Abbott here kind of rising up in the last week. You look in Montana with Matt Rosendale versus John Tester, North Dakota with Heidi Heidkamp versus Kevin Kramer, uh, Arizona, Nevada. Really, you've got state after state, Missouri, Tennessee, where you've seen Republican enthusiasm start to grow in ways in the last couple of weeks. And it's really, I think, based on two things. It's one, 